welcome uh, to the official seventh Outride Research uh, Symposium. So 2017, this thing started. Uh, and just to, to call out someone in the audience, uh, Dr. Kim Price, sit down here, please wave, big wave. There she is. Um, so Dr. Kim Price, on, on my first day at Specialized, on my first day with the Specialized Foundation, we hosted the first Specialized Research, uh, sorry, Outride Research um, Symposium. So it has grown, uh, it has expanded significantly, and we're very excited to have you all here today. So for those who went through champion training for the last two days, you've already seen this, our vision. Um, the key words I'd like you to uh, focus on that you will learn more about is the social, emotional, and cognitive health and the impacts of cycling on the gray matter uh, between your ears. How do we get there? Our mission is to provide research, cycling programs, and funding to our communities to empower those outcomes. You'll notice research is first. It really starts with the research, improving the benefits of cycling. Uh, I mentioned this uh, to our champion trainers the last couple days. Uh, this is something that's very important and, and a fundamental shift in my thinking uh, when it came to cycling over the last uh, five, six years. The true benefit of cycling is on your social, emotional, and cognitive health. The physical benefits are a, a outcome of that. They're not the goal. The physical benefits, the strength, the flexibility, the agility, the endurance, all those things, they, they start up here. They're controlled by your brain. And if you're not aligned socially, pro-socially with your, your peers who you're riding with, if you're not in a good mental health uh, state of mind, and, and emotionally, if you are, are disconnected from your world or reality, I don't care if you're the strongest, fittest man or woman in the world. It, it won't actually matter uh, to your happiness and your life. So uh, before we uh, turn it over to our, our founder of Specialized and co-founder of uh, Outride, uh, we have a very special message uh, from uh, some very, very fast cyclists who truly understand the, uh, the benefits of cycling. Hello everyone from Specialized and Outrides. Riding hard for you. Thanks for your support over all these years. Everybody has to outride something. I will try to bring home the yellow for you. Watch the fan. Yeah, pretty awesome. Okay, so without further ado, uh, our co-founder, Mr. Mike Sinyard. All right. Thank you. Great to have everyone here. And um, as, as said, we this research started about 11 years ago um, with the belief, uh, the firm belief that, uh, you know, cycling changes your lives, lights up your brain. And that was something that we wanted to prove. And, and I think with all of you, you know, we have proved that. We proved that from testimonials of the, of the, of the kids, old kids too, uh, right? And, and uh, teachers and parents. And it's, it's really so powerful. And now the research that all of you have done. And so it's so powerful to see that. And as David was saying, that um, really lighting up the brain and the emotional part of it is so, so powerful for people to find that calmness, right? So powerful, especially in the world that we live in now, more important than ever. So it's a really exciting day. I look forward to meet um, all of you um, over the day. So thank you for all your dedication and belief in this. And, um, you know, one of the things is also, besides the kids, uh, we want to prove in the future, we already believe um, that the cycling lighten up your brain uh, for aging adults with dementia is absolutely huge. And we believe that as much as the ADHD and outriding other things. So super exciting. Look forward to see uh, and talk to all of you and hear your stories and what you believe. So. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Esther, Dr. Esther Walker, who's leading all this research. Esther. See if I can, can you all hear me out of this one? All right. So thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, David, for that, that wonderful intro. 
Uh, and thank you all for being here today, uh, not only in person, but also uh, the many, many, many of you from around the world that are tuning in online. Uh, we're really excited to, to share this work with you. Um, we're so excited to kick off the summit uh, with our keynote presentation, um, who um, we unfortunately don't have tuning in live today. He's, he's in Australia, has done a number of um, travels around the world. Um, we tried to make it work, and at the end of the day, uh, decided not to, to make him stay up till 2 a.m. to present. So uh, he has sent uh, his, his message in virtually. I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, um, and the presenter for today will be Dr. Simon Rosenbaum. Uh, and he is, we can clap soon, but he is an associate professor uh, at the University of uh, New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, and he is in the Faculty of Medicine Health uh, within the discipline of psychiatry and mental health. Uh, and his research focuses on physical activity and mental illness with a focus on populations exposed to trauma. He is the president of the Australasian Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and co-chair of the Olympic Refuge Foundation's think tank on sport and displacement settings. Uh, he's an expert in looking at the associations between physical activity and mental health and really excited to be able to share that with you today. So uh, let's welcome him virtually. Uh, he'll be watching probably, you know, once he wakes up uh, the following morning. Uh, so let's let's hear from him. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be with you today. Um, it's currently about midnight, I think, in LA the day before. So I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person and um, that I couldn't join you live. Um, unfortunately, the time zones here in Australia just aren't very friendly. Um, I'm already a little bit jet lagged as well. I've just returned from, from Bangladesh where we do a bit of work. So I'm really sorry that we couldn't make that work. Um, look, thanks to, to Esther and, and the team for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of our work from here in Australia and also from overseas around physical activity and mental health um, from an implementation perspective. We'll talk a bit about the evidence um, and then hopefully some takeaways for any mental health professionals in the room, but also physical health practitioners as well. I know there's a bit of a diverse audience. Um, and also, with any questions, please feel free to get in touch via social media or email and more than happy to, to continue the conversation. Okay, so firstly, I, I'm here in Australia, in Sydney, um, and it's tradition here that we acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land that we live and work on and um, acknowledge the, the history of colonisation here in Australia. So I'd just like to acknowledge the, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people here in the lands um, where I am at the University of New South Wales and acknowledge their connection to country. For those that haven't been to Australia, um, this is what some people imagine Australia is like, that everything's trying to kill you. It's not quite that bad. And hopefully some of you have, have been here or are interested in coming. Everyone's more than welcome. Um, a little bit about where we are, the University of New South Wales. So it's about 15 minutes from that famous beach. Although if you're in LA, this won't be too, um, too special for you guys over there. I'll see the kangaroos, the opera house and the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge as well are all reasonably close by. What I thought we'd start with, and I know that, again, there is a diverse audience in the room, but just talking a little bit about the difference between mental health and mental illness. Um, they are different words. They exist on different spectrums. We often use them interchangeably. But the reason this is important, because when we're talking about the relationship with physical activity, it does differ and the, and the language is important. So as a bit of an example, we've got on this x-axis, you can see serious mental illness or no mental illness. Um, so obviously we're talking about different conditions there, ranging from, from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, um, you know, anxiety, some of what we call the more common mental disorders, depression, anxiety, through to no mental illness. And on this y-axis, we've got mental health. So optimal mental health up at the top here, and then poor mental health. And just acknowledging that at any point in time, someone's mental health varies. So we can uh, have... A mental illness and have optimal mental health but likewise there can be an absence of mental illness but someone can still be experiencing poor mental health and I'll just explain what I mean by that so if I take myself for example um I don't have a mental illness but right now it's it's 5 p.m I've been awake for a long time we've been at a conference here in Australia all day this is the second talk I've done today um I'm a bit tired a bit stressed um, need a bit of sleep. So you could say that I'm somewhere down here. 
Um, likewise, we could have someone that has even a serious mental illness, whether it's major depression, schizophrenia, like, like I mentioned, or even an anxiety disorder. Um, but they might be engaged in therapy, engaged in treatment, um, whether that's talking-based therapy, medication, group therapy, a combination of all of those things. Um, and at any point in time, or at that specific point in time, there they could be experiencing optimal mental health and living a, a functional, um, contributing life. So again, with each of these quadrants, when we talk about the relationship with physical activity, there, there is a role, no matter which quadrant someone is in. So even if we have someone here with serious mental illness, experiencing optimal mental health, exercise can play a role. Likewise, if we were in this bottom left-hand quadrant, you know, with serious mental illness, poor mental health, there's still a role for activity. And in fact, that group is probably where we can see the most benefit and the most potential. The challenge is that it's also the hardest to engage. We need the most resources. They need the most support. And we have to right, provide the right structure um, and the right services around someone there in order to be able to participate in activity. Now, we've got this question here, what is routine mental health care? And we use this diagram a lot for a few reasons. So one, it points out this, this dichotomy between physical health and mental health and the way that health systems are typically structured where we have the, the psychiatrist, the psychologist at one end dealing with the head or the, or the emotions. And then we have the, the physical health practitioners, the, the GP or the, the uh, primary care physician in the, in the US dealing with the body and we, and we really separate them or we treat them like they're completely separate and we know that's absolutely not the case and that the, the the way we feel impacts our physical health and our physical health impacts our, our mental health the other issue that you can see here and i'll talk a little bit about that is that the the image of that that man is is very deliberately obese and that's because we know that poor mental health um, is absolutely associated with poor physical health People that experience mental illness are far more likely to, to experience things like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and ultimately to die earlier. So just for having a mental illness, someone can expect to die somewhere between 10 and, and 20 years earlier than the general population uh, due to that preventable cardiovascular disease, which is a really a, a horrible statistic. And it's where things like cycling, sport, physical activity-based programs can have a big impact in improving not only physical health but also mental health but so the question here about well what is routine mental health care and imagine if something like this this game this is chinlon this is a, a game that's common in south asia um, that photo was taken in in the kudu palong refugee camp in in bangladesh it's one of the biggest or the biggest refugee camps in the world and we've done a lot of work there looking at the role of sport and physical activity for that community. Um, the game, you can see it's, it's like volleyball, but it's played only with your feet. Um, and it's this cane ball. So it's, it's you know, extremely athletic. And you can see that photo of that young man there. Um, but this idea about, well, could a game like that be considered mental health care? And I think the answer is absolutely yes, if it's done in the right way. I'll, I'll hopefully convince you a little bit about that as, as, as we go on. You know, interesting, a few things might jump out at you in that, that image. And one is the, the lack of visibility of women or girls. And that's a, a big issue in terms of who has access to these strategies um, and some of the safety issues as well. But we'll talk a little bit about that. So this, this poster here, hopefully, you know, is unlikely to be a surprise to people. So cardiovascular disease and the, and the risk of cardiovascular disease can be reduced through what we call the big four risk factors. So protecting people from smoking, eating a healthy diet, increasing physical activity and avoiding harmful use of alcohol. So it's really not a surprise. We all know that they're good for us and associated with our physical health. Now, what we could actually do is cross out cardiovascular disease, replace that with poor mental health. And that's what the evidence tells us. That's how strong the evidence is that all those what we call modifiable lifestyle factors have a big influence and impact on our mental health outcomes. Now, the evidence, and I'm not going to spend too long talking about academic papers because I know it puts most people to sleep. It's just to know that they are here and I can make them available to everyone. I think I've got some QR codes possibly coming up. Um, 
But this paper here, this diagram was from what was called a, a meta review that we published a few years ago, led by Joe Firth from the University of Manchester. And we looked at the relationship between some of these risk factors, including sleep and some of the most common um, mental disorders. So you can see ADHD, anxiety, depression, bipolar, and psychotic disorders. The thickness of that line between these uh, represents the strength of the evidence. So some of the strongest evidence we have is for physical activity um, across the range of, of conditions. And again, the, the challenge really is how do we, we match the resources and the support to the needs of the individual Someone living with a, a psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia may need a lot more support um, than someone from the general population without that disorder in order to be able to participate in physical activity. But if we can do it and we know there are ways that work and it can be done, um, it can have a huge impact on, on not only physical health outcomes, but also mental health outcomes at the same time. And I'll give you a second if anyone wants to, to scan that. But also don't worry because I can make these slides available. So hopefully they can be distributed somehow. Now, the, this idea about exercise and particularly depression gets a lot of media coverage. They, they really like sort of covering these topics. But there's a few things that we need to be careful of. And this was a, a piece in the New York Times in 2016 that was written about a study we published led by a colleague of mine, Felipe Schuch, who's, who's in Brazil and has done some brilliant work looking at, at exercise and depression. Um, one of the problems is the images that we see. And you can see this, this image that went with that article. Um, having pictures of, of you know, very athletic or sports models running into a new dawn does absolutely nothing to motivate or convince the people that we need to talk to. Um, so we've got to be really careful about that and also using images of, of you know, perfect bodies for, for a lack of another phrase. Because um, that's not what a lot of people, what the typical person looks like. So it can be actually demotivating and we've got to be really careful with the messaging when we just tell people, hey, exercise can help because sometimes it's interpreted as we're just shaming people or lumping yet another thing onto someone who might be struggling with different aspects of, of, of life, including mental health, and saying, look, if you just do some push-ups, it can be better. Um, so the messaging here is really, really critical. And, and there was a, a study recently in a, a really unfortunate press release that compared exercise to medication and concluded that exercise was, was better. Now, that's a really terrible conclusion to be making that, that is not grounded in evidence um, and is also not uh, is not the message we want to be sending. Some people need medication and that's okay. They can still benefit from exercise and activity. For some people, exercise may be enough in terms of mild to moderate mental health conditions. Um, but it's really important that the messaging we, we communicate around this topic is that no matter where on that spectrum of mental health or mental illness you are, there's a role for physical activity and movement but that we match the support to the needs of the, of the people we're working with. Now, there was, you know, I always enjoy the social media comments around this. Um, I'll let you read the first one yourself, but the second one here, often a hallmark of depression is to be unable to get up and go in the first place. So while exercise is a wonderful antidote, it's difficult to implement for many. And, and we see this time and time again, and I do a whole lecture for students here on you just using social media comments like this. And I think it's really important. It's up to us as providers of physical activity programs to actually engage with this and not shy away from it and to go, right, well, what, what systems and structures can we create? What environments can we create to actually support people that are experiencing poor mental health to be able to engage and to be able to participate? Um, so again, QR codes here, I'll move myself out of the way in case that's there. Um, so that is a recent meta-analysis, an updated meta-analysis we published on treatment. Um, and there's one from 2018 we published on physical activity preventing depression. Um, and I can summarize the results from that 2018 review. And this is where a meta-analysis is where we combine all the available data on a topic into another analysis and reanalyze it statistically. And it gives you a, a really nice overview of the evidence and it's the um, some of the strongest evidence that we can generate. 
So in 2018, what we found was that if we shifted the population's physical activity levels by as little as 60 minutes per week, so that's an hour a week, um, it doesn't have to be in one go, it could be split between you know, different days of the week. But if we shifted the population's physical activity by as little as 60 minutes, we would prevent somewhere between uh, 12 and 19% of incident cases of depression. So, or sorry, 12 to 17% of incident cases of depression globally. Now, if you just think about the burden of depression and we say, right, if we get the population moving by as little as an hour a week more, it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't necessarily matter about the intensity, but it's doing something. It's moving our bodies a bit more. We could prevent a significant percentage of the burden of depression, which is a really amazing statistic. So there's a lot of reasons to be thinking about investing in activity, not only from a treatment perspective, but also from the, the potential for prevention and preventing some of the burden of poor mental health. This sums it up again, you know, quite nicely, I think. I'm sorry for the language, but, you know, I do think this is really important. Someone saying, I'm sick of people who saying I don't have, who don't have a mental illness saying that I should exercise to help me, help my mood. I don't have the energy to shower, make food. So how am I going to exercise? Just shut up. And I think this is really important. And what this speaks to is the need for us to consider what we call the social determinants of health as well. So that's the conditions in which people live, work, play, things like poverty, social exclusion, food security, how those things can actually play into someone or influence someone's ability to participate in exercise and physical activity. Um, too often programs that we have are actually a luxury, you know, or a privilege for those that can afford it. Um, or those that have access. So we've got to think about how can we create programs that actually uh, can support some of the most disadvantaged or the most excluded people within our communities. Now, when it comes to the mental health benefits of physical activity, not all physical activity is equal. Um, so what I mean by that is four different what we call domains of physical activity. And I'll go through them now. So the first one's what we call leisure time, physical activity or recreational physical activity. I think the last time I presented this slide, I was in New Zealand. So that's the, the New Zealand Women's World Cup team. So that's recreational leisure time, physical activity, even though it's their job. It's a little bit tricky, but we won't get on technicalities there. The next picture is, is what we call occupational physical activity. So that's someone that may be a manual labourer or someone that's physically active during, during their work hours. Household physical activity, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. And this photo from Uganda is uh, transport-related physical activity. So there's four different domains of activity. Now, they're not all associated with mental health benefits, which probably won't be a surprise if we think about it. So leisure time and transport do have mental health benefits. Yeah, and that makes a lot of intuitive sense if we think about it. Um, because if you think about what that means is that someone has uh, the time, so there's a luxury of time, there's a luxury of safety, because there might be footpaths or, or, or road safety where they can walk, they might have access to, to running shoes or, or sneakers. Um, so there's a lot of different factors, or they can afford a gym membership, or they can afford the registration fees uh, to join a sporting club. So it makes sense that those two can be associated with positive mental health. It's also that element of choice, because if you're engaging in those, then it's likely a choice, which is good, and there's ownership and autonomy. Work-related mental health, work-related uh, physical activity is associated with, with mental ill health. Now, again, that's not really a surprise. If you're forced to be a manual labourer for, for 18 hours a day, it's unlikely that that type of physical activity is going to bring mental health benefits. Yeah, so it's not really a surprise. And finally, oh, sorry. Um, finally, uh, household activities, household chores seem to have no relationship. You know, I know for me personally, they have a negative relationship, but that's not what the, the evidence says. So when we think about promoting activity for mental health benefits, we need to be thinking about that choice, that autonomy, that leisure time, and that transport-related activity. So it could be getting off the bus, a stop earlier. We've heard all these cliches before. Riding a bike, you know, that's the focus of this, this summit. So there's, there's a good evidence there around that transport-related activity. 
Okay, so this was some work that was published really recently led by, by Stuart Vella here in Australia. And I think this diagram is really important to help us think about the mental health benefits of activity. Um, you know, traditionally the thought has been, right, it's the minutes of activity. It's how many minutes we spend active. Um, there's a lot more to consider. And what we're learning is that there's these other type of factors that, that, that really influence not only adherence to activity and someone's ability to engage in physical activity, um, but also whether they're likely to stick to it. So the first question we can see is the type or the mode. So that's what you do. And we know that can be important. Um, what I'll just point out here is the most important thing is enjoyment. So if we really want to know what the biggest predictor of exercise adherence over the long term, uh, it's, it's enjoyment. We need to find something people enjoy. It's the first thing. So the second is that, uh, sorry, just on, on type, what I will mention other than the enjoyment, the type of exercise doesn't actually seem to matter. There's not a lot of evidence that one type of exercise has better mental health effects than another. We have more evidence for aerobic-based exercise compared to resistance or other types of activities, but really that's just because of the ease of actually conducting those studies and collecting that data. It's far easier to run a study where you get people walking than it is to maybe use a gym or some sort of other specialised equipment um, like a bike. But there's no, there's no real evidence that one type of exercise is better than another. It's really what that individual wants to do. But some of the other considerations when and why you do it. So we mentioned those domains, for example, the transport. Another question that we're seeing more and more evidence around is the physical environment. If you are lucky enough to do something outside, it's likely to have added benefits if you can be in nature. Um, so we hear a little bit about the green gym and the blue gym, the green gym referring to activity done outdoors and the blue gym referring to activities done in or around water. So whether it's kayaking, surfing, swimming, whatever it might be. Again, we want to be cautious in recommending that one is better than the other. It's, it's really not. We don't need people to have access to a lake or, or an ocean or a harbour um, in order to get mental health benefits of movement. If you do, it's a bonus and that's great. Another important factor is the social environment. So who you're doing the activity with. Um, we know the quality of the, the instructors, for example, which is the next point, how it's delivered, the social aspect. If you're riding in a peloton, and I've got a little video that I'll, I'll send a link around some work we did in Australia about that, um, that social aspect is really, really important and can help with the engagement, but also with the, with the sort of mental health benefits and psychosocial benefits that we see from activity. That how it is delivered, the quality of coaches can be really important. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the risks of, of uh, what we'd say is poorly delivered sport and physical activity. Again, we'll make these available. Now, one of the points I mentioned earlier uh, is around the, the intersection of physical and mental health, and particularly the physical health of people living with mental illness. Um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm a bit exhausted the past few days here, we've had a, a conference in Australia called Equally Well. And Equally Well is, is committed and entirely focused on reducing the disparities in physical health outcomes for people living with mental illness. So that gap in life expectancy I mentioned earlier of up to you know, between 10 and 20 years for people living with mental illness, trying to reduce that so that people, um, there's an equality and equity in, in not only life expectancy, but also quality of life. Now, the idea of the, the physical health of people with mental illness being a, a global issue um, was recognized uh, in this document. So this is what we call the Lancet Commission, which is a, uh, the Lancet is a medical journal, very influential medical journal. And they run commissions on, on topics that are deemed of being international significance. So in 2019, we had a commission led by Joe Firth on the physical health of people with mental illness, which just is, is there to show how important and global this issue actually is. So the key statistics from, from that commission, I won't spend too long on this, but just to point out that any mental illness is associated with obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So just for having a mental illness, someone is up to two times higher risk. So a, double, a twice increased risk of having those poor physical health conditions. 
Now, what we see is we see disturbances or changes in these lifestyle behaviors. So smoking, alcohol consumption, sleep, physical inactivity, dietary habits. There's a disturbance in those risk factors from illness onset. So as soon as someone is diagnosed with a mental illness, we can often measure changes in these factors. Now, what that means is that there's an opportunity to interrupt and to intervene and potentially change the trajectory of these illnesses through interventions and programs that target those risk factors. So what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the work I've done as an example is in post-traumatic stress disorder with, with veterans and emergency service workers. Now, what we know is that their lifestyle factors uh, change. They often become socially withdrawn. They're drinking more. They're less active. They might quit. They, you know, they're socially disengaged and diet changes as well. Now, there's a interesting work happening now around our smartphones and, and the potential for our smartphones to measure all of those factors and to potentially notice that there's a disturbance in those factors before we do and even before there's mental health consequences, which is a really interesting idea of work. And the idea that we might have targeted interventions that target things like activity, target sleep, you know, social interaction, um, uh, through warning signs when we can detect that there's changes and that therefore people are potentially at risk of experiencing a mental health episode. One of the recommendations or one of the key recommendations was that mental health services need to provide sufficient access to supervised exercise programs as part of treatment. So this is where all those practitioners in the room providing physical activity services or cycling-based services, whatever they may be, there is absolutely a need justification and evidence that we need those um, as part of not only treatment but prevention for people living with poor mental health um, and that physical health we need to be thinking about prevention because once we've we've waited until someone's already obese and, and has diabetes and experiencing heart disease um, it, the damage has been done and it's not to say we can't help but we really need to be thinking about this from a prevention point of view now, I just want to talk a little bit about some work we're doing with the Olympic Refuge Foundation just to help people think about these sorts of interventions and that sport isn't just sport. So we can't just hand someone um, a bike, for example, and expect that that's going to treat. Um, what we need to do and what this is about is about matching the needs of an individual, with the matching the resources with the needs of an individual. So if we think about this, this pyramid at the bottom, what we're talking about is we need some level of equipment and infrastructure. So to, to provide an intervention, we at least need some sort of equipment or somewhere to do it. And that's really the bottom. But we'd say that if that's happening, and so you know, a lot of the work I do is in refugee contexts and particularly uh, refugee camps, we might have an organisation come in and, and hand over um, footballs, for example. And that's great, but that's, you know, really a level, what we'd say, level one. It's down the bottom. It's providing that equipment, providing that infrastructure. The next level might be thinking about existing resources in the community, so community sport or, or physical activity programs. Um, but often they may not be safe or they may not be accessible or appropriate for people living with, with poor mental health or experiencing difficulties. Now, what I mean by safe is not physically safe, but also psychologically safe. So the right environment, the right support. If we then take those coaches or, or personal trainers or whoever's providing that intervention and maybe train them in something like mental health first aid, which is a, a, a program that's international, that's basic foundational skills of mental health, um, skills in terms of how to recognize, how to respond, how to refer. Um, there's, there's different programs like Team Up or Sport for Development programs, but that might be a, a level three intervention where we've got some, some focused, targeted work, but non-specialized. Non and then finally, at the top, we might have specialized support. So university qualified health professionals. In Australia, we have exercise physiologists, physical therapists, in the US, it might be kinesiologists or whatever the training might be, but they're, they're health professionals who are trained to provide these interventions. And I think that this can be useful to just think about the, the different types of resources that we need for the right person and make sure that we're not uh, under-resourcing our intervention. For example, if we're trying to work with a, with a group that might, be, might have really specialised needs, that we're not just providing equipment and thinking that's going to be enough. There's going to need to be more support given. 
Now, I did manage to get this in some some work specifically on cycling. So this is work that we did in in 2019 and also 2017. Now, I'm not a cyclist. I I got punished on these two trips incredibly. So I think the first trip we rode 800 kilometers in a week, and it was the first time I had ridden in a peloton in my life, and it was an absolute punish we got through it but we rode all the way up the west coast of australia uh, raising money for for mental health research and talking about exercise with communities along the way and physical activity um we also published some data uh on that experience where we looked at the uh so that that image there sorry is 2019 so that um, was up the east coast of australia right up to the northern tip what's called cape york um, again, it was also a punish. I was incredibly ill-prepared for that, but it was a, a wonderful experience. We actually measured mood states of the riders along that journey and, and found some really interesting things about how preparing for an event like this, um, how that can impact our mental health, how we can feel during, but also afterwards, how they can be a little bit of a dip. And when we've had this big thing that then suddenly ends and the, the impact that that can have. There is a, a seven-minute documentary, and I won't won't play it, but I'm hopeful that QR code works, and it is about cycling and about mental health and about how that can come come together. So the the company, the the charity there that we raised that money for was called Tool Cross Oz. Um, there's a bit of stuff online, but happy to share more resources about that as well. Now, one really important point here is about can sport cause harm, and this comes back to that pyramid idea of just you know maybe just providing access, but not thinking about the quality of the coaching or the quality of, of who's delivering or supervising that sport. Now, this work was done by a, a close friend of mine, Justin Richards, in northern Uganda in a place called Gulu, which is a post-conflict setting. Um, now, Justin was there doing his PhD. He was just evaluating this sport for development program, so a, a football competition, or we'd say soccer down here in Australia. Um, or we'd say footy, actually, but we have four different types of footy and I won't even go into that. So um, Justin was evaluating this program and interestingly, they had coaches from the community, so local local volunteers. Those coaches had never been trained in, in coaching, in mental health or how to engage with youth. Now, what that meant was that the only thing they knew about coaching <clears throat> was what they had seen on the English Premier League which is a man in a suit walking up and down the sidelines screaming at the players. Now, these players were from a post-conflict setting. A lot of them were child soldiers. And having that stress and having a coach scream and yell at you in a competitive environment, it's unsurprising that mental health outcomes got worse in this study. And I think it's one of the most important studies for this work that we have and what it speaks to is that importance of having qualified, trained sports coaches that are, it can be supported by mental health professionals and that we have this tag team and that we approach this from both sides where we have a mental health workforce that's trained in sport and we have a sport workforce that's trained in, in mental health. Now, that's what we're talking about here with, with future workforces. And what does the, the talk I gave earlier today was talking about reimagining the mental health workforce of the future and how that can actually come together. And this is some work that we're doing together with the Olympic Refuge Foundation. We're providing what's called psychological first aid, which is similar to mental health first aid, but it's used in humanitarian contexts. And again, it's that foundational skills around uh, mental health, how to respond safely and how to link people, look, listen, link people with services. So we're providing that for physical health professionals. So that's coaches, um, sports coaches, physical education teachers, um, and that work's being led by Dr. Leslie Snyder. And then on the other side, how do we train mental health professionals so that they can be aware of sport, physical activity, and how they can actually work together and that we can create these, these referral pathways. Now, we've been doing this work for a little while now so we started in paris with a with a pilot we then went to moldova which is a, a small country bordering ukraine it's been significantly affected by the ongoing ukraine crisis um we then went to poland where we brought sports coaches and mental health professionals together for three days and we did a joint training 
Um, and now what's happening is we have one psychologist and one uh, sports teacher in every region in Poland rolling this training out. Uh, but they're doing that together. There's joint supervision, there's joint support, which is a really interesting way of approaching it. So we're excited to see where this work uh, goes. I'm going to finish up shortly. I just thought I'd talk a little bit about projects that we, we have here in Australia as well. Um, and this is something I'm really excited about. This is a, a, a room that we call Addy Moves that's embedded within a, a charity, an organisation called Addison Road Community Organisation here in Australia, in Sydney. Uh, Addy Road primarily deals with food insecurity. So there's a food pantry. Um, but there's also about 60 other charities on the site that provide services ranging from uh, domestic violence charities, uh, legal aid, disability support services, refugee support services, range of, of, of services all on the same site. Um, and about 18 months ago, they gave us this building and we were able to convert it into what we're calling a, a not gym. It's a really, the idea is that it's a safe space for people to come and, and participate in, in appropriate, enjoyable, culturally safe physical activity. Um, at the moment, it's funded partly by uh, uh, refugee health here in, in Australia. So we'll just acknowledge them. And the focus is people from a refugee and asylum seeker background, particularly women, because there is just a, an absolute lack of services for, for that group where they can safely participate in physical activity. Now, that's what it looks like now, which is really exciting. And, and on the left, we have some of the, the amazing people that we've been working with, including Moza Zimbatar, who's a Kurdish refugee and asylum seeker who was detained by the Australian government for eight years. Um, and we also have three women from Afghanistan who fled the recent crisis, Mawra, Mawra and Fahad. Um, and they painted that mural with a, with, uh, uh, to launch the, the service that Adi moves. We're very grateful for their, for their support. Um, as part of this program, we've gone through a really detailed what we call co-design process. And co-design, for, for those that don't work in mental health, is, is really in, in prioritising this idea that there's nothing about us without us if we're talking about a group of people, be it people with mental illness or people from a refugee background. You know, we, we absolutely need to consult and we need to, to, to understand how we can develop programs together. So uh, my postdoc, Dr. Grace McEwen, led this work where we went through a very lengthy um, co-design process with people around this, this exercise service. So we interviewed not only service users, but also service providers um, over a 12-month period. We recorded those interviews. We then transcribed and analysed those, those transcripts. And we then edited the, the recorded interviews into a movie where we could then play that movie back to all the participants and ensure that we then went through another round of feedback to, to ensure that what we'd taken and what we were hearing was, it was exactly what they wanted to say. Um, so we did that and we've then got this, this movie that we can show around exactly what's needed. And we've also written a paper that's currently under review. But I'll just talk you through the, the, the five key findings from that paper around and, and this is about how do you design a, a physical activity or exercise service for people from a refugee or asylum seeker background but i think some of these key messages actually are applicable to, to lots of other you know socially disadvantaged or excluded groups for whom a traditional gym might not be be safe or appropriate um, those five points so one we need to ensure cultural and psychological safety now, that's going to mean different things in different contexts, but a lot of it's going to mean listening to the people that we're actually working with and finding out what they need. Uh, for example, people that have experienced sexual violence, there might be issues around mirrors or touching or things that we need to be uh, aware of in that context. So being really clear about who, is, who are the people that we're targeting and what do they need in order to feel safe in an environment. Um, it's often this like challenging our assumptions. One of the things that we we learned was that the bright light in in the gym was actually quite triggering for some of our attendees who had uh, spent time in an inpatient acute mental health unit. So that was something that we needed to cover and we needed to address. So there, there are things that you just can't predict and we need to ask. Two, accessibility. The big thing for this service is it has to be free. So there's a leisure centre not far from where we are. People on a pension can, can access that for you know, only a few dollars, but those few dollars actually exclude so many people because they just can't afford it. Um, so that, that's you know, really key, understanding that accessibility. 
thinking about these physical activity programs and also how they can relate to basic needs. Now, that's that might sound a little bit um, strange, but they can actually be, uh, people can come to these services, but then we can link in with other services. So something like sport, physical activity, it's, it's not stigmatised in quite the same way that mental health care is. So often we can use these programs to catch people you know, it's like a bit of a safety net and we can then funnel them through to, to more traditional mental health services. So think about how can we link with basic services? For example, at Addy Road, there is a food pantry um, about 30 metres away from where our gym is. So that means that we're, we're doing a lot of work, you know, trying to engage with people who are using the food pantry to understand what are their needs around physical activity and, and movement and how can we support that? One of the things we learned was that we need clothing, we need sneakers. So we've teamed up with another charity who provides us with free access to, to exercise clothing brand new so that we can provide it to people that need it. Another one is, is physical activity literacy. So it's not just we're going to lift heavy weights and get strong. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done challenging some of those misconceptions and also the ones around body image and looks and aesthetics. You know, exercise is... is is not just for weight loss. And I think, you know, often influencers online have a lot to answer for in terms of the messaging that, that is being sent. So we've got, to, we've got to separate that. We want people moving, exercising, riding a bike because of how they feel, not because of how they look. I think that's a really important point. Um, and finally, fostering social connection. It's a critical ingredient. That social aspect is so important for recovery. It's so important for protecting and, and maintaining mental and physical health. So there's lots of opportunities there. That's how he moves. Now I'm gonna. I've got two more slides, then I think I'm done. Um, but for the the mental health professionals in the room, if there are any, I've got a couple of questions here. And just to, that that graphic there, I'll point out on anyone on YouTube. You can find these. We've made some animations in one in Arabic and one in Rohingya, targeting that community around this idea about exercise is is for everyone. Um, so those questions for the mental health professionals: Do I know the physical activity guidelines? The international physical activity guidelines it's just a start yeah the, the guidelines can be problematic um but it's really just a the idea that um ensuring that our mental health professionals do understand a little bit of the basics around physical health i've got australian nutrition guidelines but we can replace that with the us um peas and carrots it's a bit of a stab at my colleague scott teasdale the dietitian we used to argue about what was more important uh but in reality, the, the nutrition guidelines are so important and getting an understanding of that and realizing that it is more than just saying eat more vegetables um, and the role of dietitians can be so critical. Is my physical activity or nutrition nutritional messaging psychologically safe? And this is critical. You know, are we prioritizing enjoyment? Are we addressing food insecurity, avoiding stigmatizing language around body weight? Um, not focusing on aesthetics, you know, but inviting people to participate, to get curious, to understand what might work for them, focus on the enjoyment and that autonomous motivation, what might be possible in their situation so that they can participate as well. Do I know how to access additional physical health support? So, for example, here in Australia, we have very um, well-established referral pathways through primary care, to dietitians and exercise physiologists, and also peer support, which we know is critical. Um, <clears throat> it's really important that, that mental health professionals have these up their sleeves and know how to refer. refer. Uh, for those physical health professionals in the room, for example, if you're running a fantastic cycling program, are you teamed up with local mental health professionals so that they know how to engage and how to refer and what can be done together? Finally, this is super important, practicing what I preach. And we're not saying everyone needs to be an athlete, um, but we've done a lot of work here in Australia showing that we can change the culture of mental health services. But to do that, we need to start with the staff. So if you're, you know, beginning that journey of working with mental health services, start with the staff. Don't, you know, that's the best way to get change and actually ensure that we can, we can improve things long term. Now, you know, am I a mental health informed physical activity or diet professional? And a couple of questions for you. Have I done mental health first aid, psychological first aid, some sort of training around foundational mental health skills? Um, when I'm working with, with a cohort, do I actively consider the unique barriers experienced by someone living with poor mental health? 
So we talk about the social determinants, the conditions in which people are born, live, learn, work and play. Um, now, again, I've done a lot of work in, in Bangladesh in a, in, a, in a refugee camp that is extremely resource poor. Even in that setting, there is a role for physical activity and sport, but we've got to be considerate around those determinants and around what's possible and those barriers. Uh, low mood, psychiatric symptomatology, we know that has an impact. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get the general population moving. It's even harder when you think about that intersectional disadvantage of someone living with, with poor mental health or in poverty or what, whatever that situation is. So taking that into account is critical. That same thing about the messaging being psychologically safe. We need that consistent on both sides uh, and across health professionals. And again, finally, accessing additional mental health support. You know, that's critical as well. And making sure that you've got a support of a mental health professional there, finding a champion that can, can also participate and support that. Now, I've got five takeaways that are uh, all linked with songs. So normally if I was there, I'd, I'd make everyone sing, but I'll save everyone that torture for now. Um, the Beatles, some of us need more support than others. Our resources for our programs have to match the needs of the individual. It's absolutely critical. It's hard to say these without singing it, but, but I won't. Um, Johnny Nash, we talk about these new, you know, the, the emerging workforce of the future. What does that look like? Do we have a, uh, a cycling coach or a physical activity person on every mental health team? You know, absolutely we should. That's the, the future of where addressing those physical health disparities can needs to be. Uh, Cindy Lauper, and I think Cindy Lauper might have passed away today, I think. So that's um, very sad news. Um, this idea that these programs can be a safety net, they can catch people, they can engage people who, you know, sometimes in health, public health, we talk about hard to reach people. And I think that's a horrible language. They're not hard to reach. We're just bad at meeting their needs. Um, these sorts of programs are, uh, can, can do that and are really important. They can then funnel people into traditional mental health services. So we talk a lot here in Australia, we've been doing a lot of work putting exercise services in mental health facilities. But what about doing the other way around and putting mental health professionals inside physical activity uh, environments? If you're running a cycling program, do you have a, a counsellor, a psychologist, someone on site who can also be a part of that? You know, some really interesting work around surf therapy, for example, having you know, those mental health professionals on the beach engaged in the program. So that's absolutely necessary. And finally, the co-design. You know, we need co-production, but also co-delivery. Um, valuing other forms of knowledge, that lived experience is so critical. Um, those peer workers can, can do things that, that the rest of us can't and can engage, <coughs> excuse me, in a different way. Um, okay, I'd just like to acknowledge Oscar, Kiara, Grace, Gulsha, the Olympic Refuge Foundation, Addison Road, Mine Gardens. Um, and a big thanks for, for watching. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person or live, but please reach out on, on email or social media and I'd love to, to, to continue the conversation. And all the best with the rest of the conference. Thanks. But yeah, thank you so much for listening on that really uh, insightful talk. I think there's a lot of incredible information that all of us can take back and apply to our cycling programs and um, so much that we've actually been, you know, talking about in the, the past couple of days of, of teacher training that it's it's not just about, you know, uh, the equipment, but it's really that that community and, and that support that we're providing um, those students that are really going to help them reap those benefits. So. If you have any questions for Dr. Rosenbaum and, and you're online, uh, feel free to put those in the Zoom Q&A and we'll get those to him. Uh, if you're here in person and have questions, um, feel free to write them down, uh, send me an email and we'll, we'll compile those to make sure we get those answered. But for now, we'll take a little bit of a, a break. Um, we'll come back, we're a little bit behind, but we'll come back in 10 minutes at, at 9.15 for another great session. So thank you.